thank you very much for, for inviting me to present here this morning. Uh, and some of the uh, material that I'll be presenting will be material that was covered in a study I undertook uh, last year for the Queensland Government on the potential for identifying uh, rare earth mineralisation in the eastern uh, succession of the Mount Isa block. But it will also include some results that uh, I uh, was able to obtain uh, in the last couple of weeks, and in fact last week, in the field, in the, in the area, uh, which absolutely confirms the existence of a major mineral system uh, for cobalt, uh, gold, uh, the PGEs, uh, and heavy rare earths. And I'll show you very briefly uh, the, uh, some of the data from there, but I will not be divulging the location, <laughs> as it is uh, uh, very, very uh, sensitive to the client that I'm working with. So, um, as you can see, uh, this is an image of the mineral erythrite uh, in, a, in a, a peroxinite from Mount Cobalt. And this is one of the tools we use in the field for identifying uh, potentially mineralized material. It's a handheld uh, XRF device, and uh, we use a number of proxy elements that enable us to identify the potential for rare earths and also cobalt within in samples. So the, uh, the client, the, uh, the people that I'd like to acknowledge, the companies I'd like to acknowledge for the, the study that I undertook for the Queensland Government, uh, Chernova, Osmex, Hammer Metals, Magnum and Elementos, and also uh, Dr. Vera Munro-Smith, who did a PhD on cobalt mineralisation in Australia, and she very kindly provided me with a number of samples from her collection that she used in her thesis. Now, the, uh, the link to the Queensland Government report is given uh, at the bottom here, and you can download my report. So the takeaway messages that I want you to, uh, to remember from this presentation is that the geochemical data that uh, I reviewed uh, indicate that the source of metals in many of the eastern succession mineralisation systems is not from granites. It's from mafic and ultramafic alkaline intrusives. The rare earth mineralisation that we identified at Mount Cobalt is hosted by olivine bearing pyroxenites. Now these are a group of rocks, we, they're ultramafic rocks, they're very unique, they are very rich, they're very uh, rich in, uh, in scandium um, and they're quite definitive of the metal source. So the ultramafics that we recognise in the eastern succession are difficult to see because they are very commonly hydrothermally altered. So they're not observed generally in conventional geophysics. They are plume generated in members of the IOCG and the iron sulphide copper gold suite of intrusions. They were emplaced during the breakup of a supercontinent that existed prior to 1600 uh, million years ago called Columbia. More detailed examination of the field indicates that this level of crust was at a very high level in the crust for a long period of time, particularly when the mineralisation was taking place. Because we see in some of the, uh, in some of the vein systems evidence of epithermal mineralisation. And epithermal mineralisation only occurs at a depth of less than one kilometre from the surface. And in fact, some of the epithermal systems have evidence of siliceous sinters that contain traces of of bacteria. And these indicate that hot springs occurred over the IACG sources in the Mericatli, in the uh, Glencurry area. There is significant potential for discovery of high value heavy earth and critical metal mineralization in this region. And this is particularly uh, uh, important at this point in time when the trade conflicts are taking place between the West and China and China is cutting back on supply of rare earths. The, the United States government is very, very cognizant of this fact and it has recognized that it is vulnerable to restriction of supply. So both the battery metals, cobalt and copper, as well as the heavy rare earths and scandium are very important commodities. 
So the outline of the presentation will be as follows. I'll talk very briefly about the geodynamic controls on mineral systems for those that are not cognizant of the field. I'll talk about where gold and platinum comes from. I'll talk about the Eastern Succession and its link with the cobalt belt in Idaho, which were connected prior to 1.55 billion years ago. And what we discovered last week in the Cloncurry area absolutely confirms this. I'll then review the rare earth mineralization just briefly in the cobalt belt. I'll identify my search for similar mineralization in the Eastern Succession. I'll show you how I identified Mount Cobalt as the ultramafic end member. I'll then talk about epithermal systems and then the mineral system is intrusion related, uh, related mineralization. So there's been a lot of talk about magma fertility in work that's been carried out by a number of our colleague universities, particularly James Cook University. And uh, so this is an in indication of what metal source is. Here's the ore body, there's the metal source. So go back here. So the metal source, trace metal association that we see in these provides critical information regarding the metal source and the, the association of transition metals and gold and platinum in rocks from this area and from most of the deposits that occur in the Eastern Succession indicates that the source of metals is not from the crust, from granites or from the subcontinental lithospheric mantle it's from a deeper ultramafic plume source and so Seismic tomography has told us a lot about where these plumes come from. They come from the core mantle boundary. This is an image that was produced in the 17th century by a Jesuit priest called Athanasius Kircher. And he actually had geology of the earth pretty well figured out. He had mantle plumes, he had continental drift, he had degassing of the mantle to produce the oceans, he had the source of volcanoes coming from magmas, but he also had plumes rising from the core mantle boundary, which are actually identical to what we see in the most recent mantle tomographic images based on seismic tomography, which identify two major upwellings in the Earth, one below the Pacific Ocean called the Pacific Superplume, and one under the, uh, under the Southern uh, Indian Ocean called the African Superplume. So these come from the core mantle boundary and they uh, provide the mechanism by which platinum and gold are enriched in crustal magmas. The core is gold and platinum rich. And what I've identified here, or what I've shown here, go back. How do you go back on this? I'm, I won't use the laser point, it's impossible to reach. Okay, there. I'll leave it at that. Okay. So as you can see here, the abundance of, of gold in the core is in part per million level, 0.5 ppm. And this is based on analysis of iron meteorites. And we believe that iron meteorites are the material that, 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 that um, occur in the Earth's, that manifest themselves in the Earth's core. Iridium is elevated, osmium is elevated, platinum and palladium are elevated. So the total abundance of the platinum group metals is highly enriched in the Earth's core compared uh, with about 19 parts per million, compared to the abundance in the silicate earth, which is about 0.024 parts per million. And gold in the silicate earth is 0.001 parts per million. So the core is the principal source of gold and platinum. Now, how do we get it? We get it via mantle plumes, which rise from the core mantle boundary. And here we can see these hot, yeah, touch the laser pointer. Yep, hot plumes rising below Hawaii, coming from the core mantle boundary, below Iceland, and below St. Helena in the southern Atlantic Ocean. The core mantle boundary is a zone of mixing where there is mixing between 
iron metal from the core with metal with, with uh, gold and platinum and deeply circulating rising thermochemical plumes coming out of the lower mantle. What is the proof of this? The proof comes from studies that have been done along the mid-Atlantic ridge from south of, Atlanta, of Iceland towards Iceland. As we see, Iceland is a plume. As we approach Iceland, we see the content of gold increasing because the plume component is dominating the upper mantle component. We see the same thing with respect to platinum. Now, when I started this project a couple of years ago, I was aware of a study which had been undertaken by John Slack from the US Geological Survey on the Idaho Cobalt Belt. And I was also very well aware of the reconstructions that had been placed on the geodynamics of the supercontinent Columbia. And Columbia involves Laurentia, North America, and Australia, and Antarctica. And on this reconstruction, we see there is mineralization, very significant mineralization in Olympic Dam, the Eastern Curry Belt, and in the Idaho Cobalt Belt. And we see an age progression from 1.59 to 1.46 billion years. And that's when the plume broke the continents apart and enabled the rent Columbia supercontinent to break up. In, in Idaho, there is very significant cobalt, rare earth, copper, nickel, and gold mineralization. And so I figured that there may be a very good chance that we might find cobalt mineralization of significance in the eastern succession. Now, the Mount Isa block, MIB, is dominated by mesoproterozoic crust. That's 1.5. 1.8 billion year old crust. Uh, in Idaho, the same age rocks are overprinted by a younger deformational event called the Seviorogeny. They're Jurassic in age, much younger. And this was the result of plate tectonic activity of the convergent plate boundary between about, one point, about 140 to 50 million years ago. So the mineralization in Idaho is, is much more confused than potential mineralization in the Mount Isa area. In Idaho, a very interesting paper by John Slack presented rare earth data. Now these are how we generally represent rare earth concentrations. We plot them as sample divided by the chondritic ratio. We use chondrites because the earth formed from chondritic meteorites. And the reason we divide the sample concentration by the value in chondritic is to eliminate what's called the otto harkins effect, which is the effect of the presence of higher concentrations of the even atomic number to the odd atomic number elements. And if we didn't do that, we would get jagged sawtooth patterns. So this produces smooth patterns. What we see in these data from Idaho from a number of different deposits is extremely elevated concentrations with a thousand times chondrites up to maybe 10,000 times chondrites. Anything over a thousand times chondrites is all grade. This is the holy grail of what we're searching for in mineral exploration. And in the case of the heavier earths, heavier earth concentrations in the thousands are really significant because they are very rare. And on this diagram, we see these dips at europium and dip again at yttrium, and that reflects the role of fluorine in the system. Because fluorine uh, enables fluorite to form, removal of fluorite removes calcium, <coughs> which uh, europium is divalent and will move as well. So, in the Eastern Succession, we looked at a number of samples and I've a number of areas, and I've indicated these in the green ornamentation from Monikoff through Salisbury, Lorena, Gilded Rose, Jewel, Evening Star, Mount Frieda, uh, Barn Shaft and Trigger, and down to Mount Cobalt. And we also looked at samples from Elaine Dorothy and uh, Millennium. 
the uh, samples from Mount Kerbal, in fact, proved to be extremely valuable, as did some of the samples from this trend from Mount Frieda through Falcon towards Gilded Rose. This is more of the epithermal trend in this area. This is more of the source trend. So, these are some samples, firstly, of some, or some samples from Mount Cobalt. Um, there, this one is an ultramatrix schist with veins of cobalt type. The concentrations that we see in this are as follows, 9% cobalt, 3,000 ppm nickel, 3,000 ppm or so copper, 5 ppb palladium, 2 ppb platinum, and 1.2 parts per million or grams per tonne gold. <coughs> the same is true in the bottom, 5% cobalt. This one has elevated scandium, elevated copper, elevated Palladium. This one here, 9% uh, cobalt, elevated nickel, elevated copper, elevated palladium. The story is the same. We're seeing a very strong indication of an ultramatrix source here with nickel, copper, palladium, and gold. So, very, very significant. This is some of the samples from Mount Cobalt. And the textures that we see in this sample were very indicative. These are what we call pseudomorph textures. They were originally pyroxene, and they've been replaced by chloride, and some areas were originally olivine, and they've been replaced by serpentine. And then cutting through this are veins of erythrite. <coughs> and within it, there are large grains of cobaltite, and cobaltite is a cobalt arsenide. So here we have a direct link between the source rock and the enrichments that we're looking at. Th this had never been recognized. In fact, the, 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 the host rocks at Mount Cobalt had been identified as metal sedimentary units, um, as mafic dikes. The importance of the textures had never been fully appreciated. And you can see here, very beautiful, delicate replacement of the pyroxene texture and olivine. And so this is a grain of a vein of erythrite. So the igneous textures are present, shown here in both plain polarized light and cross polarized light. This rock has almost 300 parts per million scandium, and this is all grey scandium. Most times scandium deposits that are being developed are in laterite and this is the grade that they're mining. Cobalt, 10%. Nickel, 3,000 ppm. Copper, 3,000 3, ppm. Chromium elevated, reflecting pyroxene presence. Yttrium is elevated. Now this is the clue. High elevated, elevated yttrium is an indication of elevated heavy rare earths because yttrium is a proxy for the heavy rare earth elements. And it's very useful because yttrium is an element that we can use with a handheld XRF in the field. So yttrium, 600 ppm, this is exceptionally elevated. Gadolinium, one of the heavy rare earths, almost 900 ppm. And dysprosium, 300 ppm. These are incredibly unique values. And Euterbium, one of the heaviest of the heavy earths, 15 ppm. <coughs> so quite clearly, this indicated that we were on a summit. Um, other samples from Mount Cobalt, this is a glimmerite, it's a potassium altered rock, but it also has high cobalt, less scanned in because there's no pyroxene present, but it has elevated nickel, elevated palladium, elevated platinum. In fact, these platinum and palladium grades are all grade and has almost five parts per billion uh, gold. So quite a, uh, an, interesting, an interesting series of observations. Turning to Monokoff, which is one of the uh, IOCG systems out in the, to the east of Cloncurry, the thing that is apparent here is, the that was apparent to me, was the, the presence of fluorite. And you can see these purple spots here. 
That's fluorite. Uh, plain polarized light, cross polarized light. Fluorite is isotropic under cross polarized light. This rock has 7% fluorine. It is, it, this one is elevated to light rarities. It has uh, almost 1,000 ppm lanthanum elevated uh, cerium, but it has the same signature of the ultramafic alkaline source, high gold, high platinum, high tungsten, and high palladium. Uh, the, uh, the gold and palladium values were determined by nickel sulfide fire assay. The other elements were determined by ICPMS following fusion dissolution. Now I mentioned the, uh, the epithermal part of the system. These are um, <coughs> epithermal samples uh, from uh, Iron Duke, which is sitting above one of the recently drilled IOCG systems that uh, Newcrest is drilling at the moment south of Cloncurry and that Osmex is also drilling in the same area. Um, and it shows grains of quartz that are heavily embayed. These grain boundaries are indicating, these embayed grain boundaries indicating that these fluids were very, very fluorine rich. These are siliceous pretzels. They have 50 parts per million scandium, elevated copper, elevated heavier earths, and elevated gold and platinum in a epithermal system. And this goes counter to what people have generally considered that platinum is not very mobile in epithermal systems. Well, it clearly is. And cobalt about 150 ppm. The same is true in, in the bottom sample. Some of the uh, samples show beautifully preserved malachite. They're quite copper rich. Um, very gold rich, but once again, high platinum and high rare earths, heavy rare earths, and high dysprosium. This is one of the unique textures that we identified, and quite clearly it indicates, or it supports the view, that we have epithermal mineralization at a very high crustal level, and that this epithermal mineralization was being uh, induced, produced by hot springs, because these are evidence of these little spherulites are evidence of bacteria, they're spherulitic chalcedony, they're evidence of a microbial mat in a hot springs environment. And they were described, well they've been described from Yellowstone and they've also been described from some of the hot springs in southern Argentina and Chile. The sample is very gold and platinum rich with 3 ppm gold, 1.8 ppb platinum 3 pb palladium, quite unique. There's also evidence that boron was flying around in the fluid system. And all of these um, ligands are important because they promote mobilization of metals. So the boron was, the, the fluids are boron rich. Once again, high gold, high tungsten, and high platinum and palladium. Um, and there's, in fact, evidence of Visible gold, visible gold in some of these samples with beautiful coliform textures that are characteristic of boiling in a hydro, in hydrothermal deposition environment with VG. High scandium, high copper, high nickel, and high gold. So the, uh, the story goes from all of the deposits we looked at. The presence of high copper, high coal, high nickel, and high cobalt was associated in all the samples we looked at. And that started to make me really wonder about <coughs> why people were considering granites as being the sources of this mineral system, and why so much emphasis was being placed in exploration on looking at the granites and the magnetic highs, rather than looking for the ultramafics and the altered magnetic lows. So when we look at chemical variations within the system, what I've plotted on these two diagrams, uh, on the first screen, your left-hand screen, uh, data for rock samples. On the right-hand screen, data for some of the ore minerals from Salbury, Barnes, Trigger, and Notlaw. We see that nickel and cobalt are possibly correlated with samples from 
Mount Cobalt, shown in the squares, and also one of the uh, epithermal systems, Joule, showing the highest cobalt and nickel concentrations. But the correlation that we see in the sulphides matches exactly the correlation that we see in the silicate bearing uh, samples. This is very similar actually to the trend that we see at Mary Kathleen. And these are samples that I uh, analyzed from, uh, for another project from Blue Caesar and, and uh, Elaine Dorothy. Uh, two drill holes that were drilled very close to the Mary Kathleen uranium pit. And this once again shows that there's a pretty close similarity between copper, cobalt, and nickel in the Mary Kathleen belt as there is in the Cloncurry belt, suggesting, in fact, that the mineral system that we're looking at is a much larger mineral system than had previously been considered, extending from certainly Mary Kathleen through to well and truly into the eastern succession and as far south as Mount Cobalt. We see a correlation, as one would expect, between arsenic and cobalt, because cobalt very commonly um, petitions with arsenic to form cobaltite. And, and in fact, uh, here we have uh, Mount Cobalt and Jewel uh, as being the most arsenic rich samples. But we see the same trend for the whole rock samples as we do for the sulfide samples. Nickel and cobalt, and nickel and uh, but they're shown here quite well. Palladium and cobalt shows some correlation. This, particularly the sample from Monikoff is very rich in palladium and rich in cobalt, as are the trends that we see in the sulphides. So the system here that contains the cobalt, copper, gold, also contains the platinum group metals and nickel. And probably these are uh, in fact, many samples contain more than one part per billion co uh, palladium, and that, that's very significant. Considering that palladium in the upper crust has a value of only 0.5 parts per billion. When we look at the distribution of gold, some samples contain up to 100 parts per billion, parts per billion gold. That's in the case of Lorena, which is a gold mine, not surprisingly, but also Jewel, one of the cobalt rich samples. The, uh, the sulphide samples are still interesting, but don't show the levels of enrichment that we see in the suite that is dominated by the epithermal component in the system, as one would expect because gold is concentrated very strongly in the hydrothermal fluids that are responsible for epithermal mineralization. And that's why we, we search for epithermal deposits. We see some support for elements that are also associated in epithermal mineralization, such as tellurium. There's a correlation between tellurium. So there's a suggestion that some of the gold not only is present as free gold, but also as probably tellurides. Bismuth, another vector for gold is showing a good correlation with gold in these samples. So this is the sort of uh, chemical uh, treatment that one needs to indulge in in order to try and understand the nature of the mineral system. You can't understand a mineral system simply by going out in the field and measuring fold structures or lineations or trying to interpret what the metamorphic rocks are. The way you un understand mineral systems is by trying to understand protolith first, or rock type source, and then process. And unfortunately, um, I, I think uh, some of the studies that have been undertaken in this area previously have been somewhat misguided. Scandium, as I indicated, this is one of the elements that's in really high demand. It's a, uh, a very light element. It's very much like titanium, uh, very strong and light used in aircraft frames and in racing road bikes, which I like. Um, but uh, it is an element that is in high demand. And we see that some of these rocks from Mount Cobalt are incredibly enriched in scandium. That's not surprising because they're peroxinites. And scandium petitions into pyroxene structures. So when we see elevated scandium, there is a very good chance that the source rock from which that scandium came is coming from a peroxidite 
intrusion. So here's the average concentration of scanty with a crust 17 ppm. We can see that quite a lot of the samples are significantly elevated with respect to scanty. In fact, two of the Mount Cobalt samples are all, are, would be all grey with uh, over 200 ppm scanty. As I pointed out, fluorine is uh, an important ligand because it helps us understand the nature of the transport mechanism for transition metals. And we see that many of these samples are elevated in fluorine and there's a, certainly a cluster of the elevated cobalts with elevated fluorine. Um, Monokoff is the most fluorine rich of the uh, so-called IOCGs in the Cloncurry area with we have visible fluorite but also elevated uh, cobalt showing cobalt is moving around with fluorine. This is Mount Cobalt over here. We always, I always uh, suggest that my clients, we analyze a full range of trace elements, including fluorine and including uh, the platinum group, at least platinum and palladium and gold by fire assay. So fluorine is an important ligand for cobalt transport and is therefore an important vector. So when we look at the distribution of uh, the rare earths that we see in uh, the different deposits, Mount Cobalt is the standout with samples up to 10,000 times enriched in the lights, uh, going down to maybe 70 to 80 in the, in the heavies. Monokoff has a pattern here and the role of fluorine, of fluorite grabbing Europium is quite clearly seen here. These are fluorite bearing samples with a europium, positive europium anomaly. So the patterns here that we're looking for are patterns that have elevated heavy rare earths because the basically light rare earth deposits are a dime a dozen. There's plenty of them on the planet. There are not very many heavy rare earth deposits. And so in searching for rare earth mineralization, the goal is not only to find concentrations, but to find concentrations that are enriched in the heavy rare earths. <coughs> and so quite clearly some of these samples from Mount Cobalt uh, would be all grey in terms of their heavy rare earth concentrations. The, uh, the samples that we have from, from the sulphide deposits uh, show very strongly the role of fluorine influencing yttrium and, and cerium quite strong fractionation patterns and those patterns reflect the source from which these come from. They're saying that the sulphides were, were um, interacting with a silicic magma, undersaturated silicic magma, uh, a group of rock called cyanites and they're very similar to the um, some of the major alkaline intrusions that we find on, on the planet and in fact very similar to some of the cyanites that occur out in western Queensland in what I call the Diamantina alkaline province which I discovered a couple of years ago with very large intrusions up to 10 to 20 kilometres in diameter containing agbetic cyanides. So these are quite interesting showing you, I've just highlighted here the fluorine effect there, there, there and there. And this is what the rocks look like, They're, we had core samples from these some of them are cyanites and monzonites. So there are a group of rocks that are commonly associated in alkaline intrusions. That's the bottom line. And uh, on normalized plots, they, uh, some of them show up to 100 times chondrites in the heavies, but very strong light for enrichment and very strong erotium anomalies, of course, indicating fluorine. Millennium, which is a deposit that's being de developed at the moment for uh, for, um, for cobalt, um, has the same uh, cyanite type rare earth pattern, but as you can see, quite nice flat rare earth pattern. So millennium has the potential to generate heavy rare earth mineralization. Elaine Dorothy in the Cloncurry belt um, shows the same sort of pattern, and it's not surprising that there is a similarity between the mineral system that we see in the Cloncurry belt and the mineral system that is hosting the cobalt in the uh, Eastern Succession. So the types of minerals that we identified in the Eastern Succession samples, the rare earth phases, 
uh, include alanite, branerite, fluorite, lanthanite, monazite, citrusite, titanite, xenotene, and zircon. Now, xenotene is the, I guess, the, the rare earth mineral of choice because xenotene is a rare earth mineral that's a, it's a rare earth phosphate, impurium phosphate, and doesn't contain high concentrations of uranium and thorium. So, one of the major rare earth producers in Australia is Linus Corporation, and they, they have all sorts of problems uh, with dealing with the uh, um, waste from their processing plants, which are highly radioactive, because they have two minerals present at Mount Weld. One is fluorinsite, which is a light rare earth in rich phase that is also uranium and thorium buried, and the other is xenotene. Uh, so to find a deposit that is not light rare earth enriched, that's only heavy rare earth enriched, but enriched in the initrium, that is what one uh, should ideally try and achieve. So one way of looking at levels of enrichment is to, and, level, and relative amounts of light to heavy rare earths, is to plot this sort of diagram, where we plot lanthanum against ytterbium. Lanthanum is a light rare earth, ytterbium is a heavy rare earth against total rare earth concentration. Now, all grades would be at maybe a um, couple of thousand ppm or more. And so this, is show, this diagram shows a number of fields, and I've pointed out the importance of trying to understand protolith. And so this shows protolith fields. This is where alkaline fractionated large intrusions plot. This yellow field is the field that carbonatites plot. Now, carbonatites are carbonate-rich magmas that come from the mantle. Um, A-type granites, alkali granites plot here, and the hydrothermal field is down, down in this area here. So for the best heavy earth deposits, we would look, be looking ideally for low lanthanum ytterbium ratios plotting in this sort of field. For light earth deposits, high length of ytterbium ratios. These three samples <coughs> um, up here, well, Monikoff has the highest rare earth concentration with more than, uh, but these other samples have rare earth concentrations from 1,000 to 10,000 ppm. The Mary Kathleen system is absolutely identical. Trending from differentiated alkaline intrusions through two carbonatites, and this is where millennium plots. And there's one of the Mary Kathleen samples that plots down in the hydrothermal or carbofluorothermal field. This is where the, Mount, the, the cobalt, Idaho cobalt belt samples plot. They plot whack into the hydrothermal field down here. That's why they are an amazingly good target for heavy earth exploration. And that was the principal reason why I uh, approached the Queensland government to get funding to do the study which I undertook. So we've now found this component in the Fon Curry belt and I'll be showing some of that data. So even in Idaho we see two trends. We see a, a differentiation trend from silicic alkaline rocks up to carbonate alkaline rocks. Then we see a trend down into the hydrothermal field where we get enrichment is heavy rare earths at the expense of the light rare earths. And so this is the target that we're looking for in the eastern succession. We see other evidence of fluorine fractionation and carbonatite fractionation just simply in terms of these so-called CHARAC ratios, the charge and ratio control ratios, yttrium holmium and zirconium haptium. So this extension of range of yttrium holmium ratios that we see, normally they should lie in this field, which is the chondritic field, when we see them outside that field, it indicates fluorine fractionation. Fluorine fractionation indicates the potential for ligands that can move cobalt and transition metals around. So the whole thing is linked. Um, the same pattern we see in the Idaho cobalt belt, evidence of fluorine. When we look at the molar copper gold ratios, <coughs> for samples from the eastern succession, mainly from the uh, epithermal systems, we see molar copper gold ratios that are essentially very, very low. And they match perfectly the molar copper gold ratios shown for the Idaho cobalt belt. So this provides us with 
another piece of evidence that in fact the Idaho Cobalt Belt mineral system and the mineral system on the other side of the breakup of the supercontinent Columbia were similar. And these patterns, these are histograms with a large number of samples less than a, with molar copper gold ratios less than 100,000, is very indicative of an alkaline source. Molar copper gold ratios less than 5,000 is typical of epithermal systems. We see also evidence from the highly siderophile elements with uh, nickel, osmium, through to platinum and palladium and gold. Uh, Mary Kathleen system is shown in this uh, stippled ornamentation, this dark ornamentation. Samples from Mount Cobalt fall in this pattern. This elevated gold is indicating the effect of epithermal mineralization, which enhances gold at the expense of the PGs. But all the systems show a pattern which is essentially alkaline in character. And just for comparison, here are alkaline intrusions. This is the Mordor intrusion in the North, Northern Territory. These are these two big intrusions that I discovered out in Western Queensland a few years ago. The Mulligan intrusion, Lake Machati intrusion. They show the same general trend of uh, lower, lower nickel and elevated palladium, copper and gold, typical of alkaline igneous systems and not granites. So the source and transport of metals is, is important and the sub and superchondritic yttrium-holmium ratios that we see indicates the involvement of halogen rich hydrothermal fluids in the evolution of the cobalt and heavy earth and mineral systems in the area. Our many workers, particularly those from James Cook University, suggested that the mineralization in the Cloncurry area is related to the Williams and Eroku granites via magmatic hydrothermal fluids. Well, that blatantly is incorrect in terms of the metal association that we see in the Cloncurry belt mineral system. So the association of cobalt, nickel, gold, uh, copper, scandium and platinum indicates that this granitic source is unlikely and in fact impossible. And a more plausible explanation is that the metals were derived from an ultramafic uh, to mafic alkaline source like the scandium and heavy earth and gold, nickel, copper, um, uh, platinum and rich olivine websterites that occur in the Mount Cobalt intrusion. So many people have discussed the role of fluorine. Uh, there's many papers that, dis that show the importance of halogen rich fluids in moving the transition metals around. Um, and so the fluorine content of the cobalt rich samples and the sub and superchondritic yttrium holmium, holmium ratio supports that fluorine was a very important ligand in the mineral system that we have there. Now, the, I guess the trick is, if you're looking for a copper system that's also fluorine rich, you have problems with separate with uh, metallurgy. And that's one of the reasons why Monokov has failed as a mine. And so this uh, proposal um, that was the, the, that we put together, the hypothesis, the working hypothesis that in fact, there may be a similarity between the mineral system in the cobalt belt of Idaho with the mineral system in uh, northwest Queensland seems to be supported by the data that we've presented today, we've discovered today. And in fact, uh, John Slack, um, a former colleague of mine from the States when I was teaching there, um, who's now at the US Geological Survey, had, had in his paper in Economic Geology made the comment that there could be a similarity between the Idaho Cobalt Belt mineral system and some of the IOCGs in the Plum Curry Belt. Uh, and we've now gone out and, uh, and confirmed that. So the multi element association indicates that the IOCG mineral system um, in the Plum Curry area is a mafic to ultramafic source. Granites fail the fertility test. And so the takeaway messages uh, are that the mineralization of Mount Cobalt is hosted by olivine bearing peroxinites. The majority of samples have molar copper gold ratios between about 100,000 and 30,000, typical of alkaline 
igneous systems. The highly cider of our element plots, the nickel, copper, palladium, gold, uh, are consistent with a mafic uh, to ultra mafic alkaline system. And the elevated gold in these plots reflects epithermal enrichments. The spherulitic textures that we see in the epithermal veins are virtually identical to bacterial textures that have been described from Yellowstone and thus hot springs clearly operated above these IOCG source intrusions. And the ultramatrix are interpreted to be the plume generated in members of the IOCG and ISCG, iron sulfide suite of intrusions, that were in place during the breakup of the supercontinent Columbia. And significant potential therefore exists in the Eastern Succession for discovery of high value, heavy rare earth and critical metal mineralization in this suite of alkaline ultramafic bodies, which may also be associated with carbonatites. And in fact, uh, Groves and Breacher um, suggested in fact that the, source, that the source of Mary Kathleen may have been, in fact have come from carbonatites at one stage. So, watch this space. This is a photo I took last week in the field. It's a uh, quartz spritzia with a very strong uh, veining system through it. In this area, which I can't divulge the location, occurs over about a two kilometer strike length. Um, beautifully exposed. The rare earth patterns in these rocks. Uh, flat rare earth patterns elevated. Very strong enrichment in the heavy rare earths. Now these are, uh, are samples that contain quite a large amount of quartz. So these are diluted by quartz. So the actual matrix would be lying probably up here. And the matrix would be relatively easy to separate from the quartz by conventional techniques. So quite an interesting, interesting pattern. And so, in fact, the maximum values that we saw in the field are up to 50 grams a ton gold, 0.8 weight percent. Uh, this is an analysis by uh, fusion ICPMS and also by um, nickel sulfide fire assay. We picked up samples using yttrium using a PXRF, uh, scandium up to 140 ppm, dysprosium 360, ytterbium up to 200 ppm, cobalt up to 2000, neodymium up to uh, 400, tungsten up to 9000 ppm. This is a new mineral system and I would suggest you watch this space and watch the stock market. Thank you very much.